Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you all for being here. I'm um, Mehran Kamrava, uh, Director of the Center for International and Regional Studies here at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in Qatar. You'll forgive my voice. As you can see, I'm not, uh, it's not my usual beautiful melody. That, uh, um, I am uh, delighted to be able to feature tonight my good friend and uh, uh, wonderful scholar, Matt Bueller. I will introduce Matt properly in a minute, but before I do, let me first take care of a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you are new, and I see a whole row of new faces, welcome to all of you. If you're new to CIRS, uh, there is a sign-in sheet right outside, and uh, please sign in so we can um, keep in touch with you uh, for future endeavors. Future endeavors actually um, uh, happen on uh, March 24th when we will have as our next speaker of the monthly dialogue series the chairman of the Gas Exportees Countries Forum, Dr. Hossein Adeli. We're quite excited uh, about his, uh, his presence. Uh, I ask that you would also please turn your phones, uh, either put them on silent or turn them off. And if they go off during the presentation, please do not answer. Um, I also um, encourage you to visit our website, cirs.georgetown.edu, when within a week we will have a summary of tonight's presentation. Um, there will be a Q&A, and of course we will have a small reception outside after the talk. But the reason we're all here uh, to listen to Dr. Matt Bueller. Matt is the 2013-2014 postdoctoral fellow here at the Center for International and Regional Studies. He's also, I should add, the last postdoctoral fellow uh, we will have. We have changed the nature of the position and we have a research assistant. And actually, we had decided not to have a postdoctoral fellow this year, and uh, we had made that decision while we got the applications. And we were just going through the applications, my colleague Zahra Barbara and I, and we came across Matt's application, and he was just too good <laughs> to pass it. And we decided to actually delay our changes to CIRS so we could have him with us for a year. Matt is a professor of political science, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Tennessee. He is with us this year, and then he will take up his position as a Professor of uh, Political Science at the University of Tennessee. He holds a PhD from University of Texas. He has done extensive field work uh, in North Africa, particularly in Morocco and Mauritania, and i um, delighted to introduce him. We're thrilled to have him with us this year. And tonight he will talk to us on the reasons why the Arab Spring skipped over Morocco and Mauritania. So please join me in welcoming Matt Bueller. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kamrava. I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all this evening and, of course, for this wonderful year at the Center of, uh, for International and Regional Studies. I really appreciate your mentorship. Um, so, again, my name is Matt Bueller, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee. And today I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why did the Arab Spring miss the Maghreb, continuity through co-optation in Morocco and Mauritania. So here uh, in Doha for this year, I'm working on a book manuscript that uh, looks at the success and failure of opposition alliances between leftists and Islamists in these three countries. But today we're going to talk about a little bit broader project. Um, this is a culmination of over a year and a half of field work in these three countries. I conducted over 100 interviews with different politicians, including the current Prime Minister of Morocco, Abdelila Ben Kiran. So <clears throat> let's begin. To start off, a quick, a quick question for the audience. These are the four uh, Arab regimes that didn't survive the Arab Spring, the unrest of 2011-2012. What's, what's a commonality among them? 
Any thoughts? Anyone? <laughs> Secular, governments. Secular governments. Any other ideas? <clears throat> Sir? Autocrats. Yeah. Autocrats, of course. Any more? Republics. They're all republics. So the main idea, yes, they're all republics. If we think about the Arab world being divided into two different types of states, we have presidencies and non-presidencies, mostly monarchies. We can think about Qatar or Jordan as being examples of monarchies. So what we know from the Arab Spring is that monarchies seem to, to persist longer than non-monarchies. And this has become a theory known as the monarchical exception thesis. So if you think that the big question is, under what conditions did an Arab regime survive the Arab Spring? The popular hot answer these days among many scholars and policymakers is that if it was a monarchy, if it was ruled by a king, then it seemed to, to persist better, to survive better than non-monarchies. So in my research, I really examined this thesis through looking at Morocco and Mauritania. Now, of course, this is only a comparison of two states, so it doesn't explain, say, uh, the entire pattern of continuity or change within the region. But I think by looking at these two countries really in depth, that it helps to reveal things that you might otherwise not see. But in the back of your mind, we should also always be thinking about Tunisia. Because Tunisia is where uh, the, the revolution was the most successful, or these uprisings were the most successful in bringing about democratization. So really, we're thinking about Morocco and Mauritania, uh, two very, very different states, and how did they follow similar pathways to regime resilience? Oh, pardon me. So a quick little background on these two states. So in Morocco and Mauritania, uh, uh, unrest began in uh, February 2011 in both states. In Morocco, it rallied around uh, the movement, the February 20th Movement for Change, that was led by uh, a, a Che Guevara type figure known as Osama El Khalifi. He was known as the Che of Saleh. And this, this movement uh, uh, organized a series of po protests in 53 different Moroccan cities. Some of them grew quite large, especially in Rabat and Casablanca, but in general they were non-violent. But in some particular small cities like Hosima, Larash, uh, Tangier, they became violent. In Hosima, for example, five people died, 33 public buildings were destroyed. Now, in February, uh, in Mauritania, we saw a parallel movement develop, the February 25th Movement for Change. So, in, uh, in Mauritania, uh, protests were very small. They started with only 2,000 uh, people in February 2011, but by July 2012, they grew quite large, over 90,000 people. Now, 90,000 people, you know, doesn't seem that large compared to Egypt or Tunisia. But in Mauritania, you only have 3.7 million people. So that makes up almost 2% of the population. But what we know about these countries is even though they had this protest, they were able to survive the Arab Spring. How might we go about explaining this? So maybe you might think it has something to do with, with monarchy, monarchical institutions. There are many different reasons why people might say, OK, monarchies are more resilient because uh, they're, clo they're more closely associated with Islam. There's a theory that says, oh, that Arab citizens will be less likely to resist uh, uh, monarchies because they're, they're, they're kind of more natural to Arab culture than non-monarchies. There's another theory that says monarchies are better at implementing top-down reform, right? They kind of implement reforms to forestall potential opposition to the rule in ways that presidencies do not. Now, if we look at Morocco and Mauritania, we see that Morocco is really the, the, the archetype uh, of monarchies. Uh, the, the ruler, Mohammed the Sadis, Mohammed the Sixth, is very, is very closely associated with Islam through Amir al Mu'minin, saying that he's the prince of believers. He's a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, salam alayhi wa sallam. Um, and also, he's known to promote top down reform. After the protests happened, he organized new legislative elections that occurred in November 2011. He organized a new constitution as well. 
In contrast, Mahmoud Abdelaziz, the president of Mauritania, is not particularly close. I mean, of course, he's a Muslim, but he doesn't have a legacy, a historical relationship with Islam. He's not known to be a beacon of reform. In fact, only about a month ago, he organized new legislative elections, which was very, very late in the process. But at the end of the day, it didn't matter, right? I mean, these two regimes, even though one was a monarchy and one was not a monarchy, the outcome was the same. Both regimes survived the Arab Spring. Thus, we cannot conclude that this played a very key difference in driving this outcome. Another theory has to do with natural resource wealth, often oil or, or, or gold or copper, or other types of wealth that make regimes a very, uh, that give regimes a tremendous amount of resources to buy off the opposition. You might think in many of the Arab Gulf countries, that's what helped, say, uh, the UAE or Qatar forestall opposition, is that they were able to provide resources to the citizens to kind of uh, dilute any potential opposition. In Mauritania recently, they have discovered oil. They've also discovered gold, as well as uranium deposits. Morocco, by contrast, is a relatively poor state in terms of its natural endowments. There are some phosphate reserves, but nothing really to the level that we've seen in Mauritania. But again, the outcome was the same, that both regimes survived the Arab Spring. Thus, we can't say that oil was very, very important to driving this outcome. Military loyalty from Tunisia. We know that the military's likelihood to defect from the regime helped to bring about the collapse of Ben Ali's uh, rule. In Mauritania, over the last 30 years, the military has been very loyal to the Moroccan monarchy. In Mauritania, by contrast, there's a very long history of military coups. Every single milit uh, Mauritanian president has been ousted by a coup. In October 2012, uh, they nearly assassinated Mohammed Abdelaziz. So in these two countries, there's, not, uh, there's a very different level of military loyalty, and yet they still both survived the Arab Spring. Ethnic integration. Does it have something to do with ethnic minorities? In some Arab countries, maybe in Bahrain, in Syria, we might think marginalized ethnic minorities seize the opportunity of the Arab Spring to assert their demands, which made protests more potent. In Morocco and Mauritania, you have two different uh, marginalized ethnic groups. You have the Amazigh, the Berber in Morocco, and in Mauritania, you have the Haratin, who are um, essentially descendants. They're, they're Arabs in terms of culture, but they're descendants of former black African slaves. So in Morocco, the regime has been very effective at integrating the Amazigh into, uh, into society. They've made Amazigh, uh, the language of the Amazigh, an official language. Um, Amazigh elites have married into the royal family. In Mauritania, slavery still persists, right? It's still an active institution in Mauritanian society. So we can't say, okay, and the outcome, of course, is the regime survived. So we can't say that ethnic integration was a very important factor in driving this process. So, of course, the lingering question on all of your minds what is the commonality in Morocco and Mauritania's strategies of survival? Oh, pardon me. So my basic, question, my basic argument is that these two regimes employed a very crafty, robust strategy of co-optation, which they used to build certain political parties, uh, pro-regime political parties, uh, in, the, in the era before the Arab Spring, and then they deployed these political parties in order to undermine the chief political beneficiaries of the unrest, specifically youth and Islamist movements. So in Morocco, uh, the regime created the Party, party of Authenticity and, and Modernity, Hizb al-Asala wa Mu'asara, which was founded by Fuad Ali al-Himma, the very best friend of the king uh, and, and the former interior minister. In Mauritania, uh, they created the Hizb al-Ittihad min al Jamhuriya, the Union for the Republic Party, that was the personal party of Muhammad Uld Abdelaziz. So co-optation, what exactly does that mean? How does that work? It's a very ambiguous uh, concept. How do we define it? How do we measure it? To measure this, just taking Morocco as one example, I developed a, a list of candidates, statistics about different local candidates in Morocco and Mauritania, 
about 2,400 candidates. And I, and I showed when a candidate was a member of an opposition party or an independent candidate and was essentially absorbed into pro-regime parties, right? Co-opted into this pro-regime party. I have the same type of statistics for Mauritania. And then I could run a series of statistical tests to show what kind of factors are associated with this process. Was this process occurring, say, more in the city than the countryside? Was it occurring uh, in, in Amazigh areas or Arab areas? Was it occurring in poor areas or rich areas? Right? These are the kind of things I can test for. And the results of the test said that basically co-optation occurs more frequently against these local politicians in rural wealthier districts where residents have higher than average illiteracy rates. So what does this mean? This is all kind of very broad, difficult to understand. Take a little trip with me to Morocco. Imagine yourself in Morocco. What would this idealized candidate who has been co-opted look like? Maybe, you know, he's in kind of a rural area, maybe in the mountains, in the plain. He's in, an, in a district that is relatively better off than its neighbors. And finally, he represents constituents that are maybe less politically sophisticated than others. Maybe they value material possessions more than a specific ideology, uh, ideological preferences. Here, just as a side note, this is a picture of Fuad Ali al himma the, uh, the best friend of the king. So we really need to look at some specific examples to understand how this works. So here, this is in Mauritania here. This is one example of a rural mayor, Somo Sodimba, who is the mayor of Kaidi. I interviewed uh, mayor, mayor Simba. And he said to me, look, in 2006, I was an independent candidate. I could get nothing from my district. I could do nothing to help my constituents. As soon as he decided to join the, the, the pro-regime party, he was able to build a new stadium, new roads. Uh, and basically what he said to me is that in Mauritania, the money comes from the power. You cooperate with the power or you don't get anything. So he's been able to more effectively serve his constituents by, by working with the regime. In Morocco, a similar story. Here, this is Abdul Karim Shukri, a mayor of Darboua Bouaza, an area outside of Casablanca. This is a, a fellow who's a, a member of a, a local aristocratic family. And what he told me is, he said, look, my family owns two large plantations in this area. We have about 100 peasants working for us. It's my responsibility historically to help these people, to, to gather resources so that they can do their agricultural, so they can, so they can farm well. And so he essentially moved from a very small uh, regional party to this, this regime party in order to attract these resources to his district. So now after we understand how this co-optation works, let's think about how these strategies might be used against the opposition. So here, this is the weakening, the weakening of youth movements. Here, this is a picture of Osama al-Khalifi, the Che of Saleh. Uh, and Osama al-Khalifi, the, the party used the exact same strategy against these local politicians uh, as against Osama al-Khalifi. It essentially approached to him and they said, Osama, look, if you join our party, we'll give you a very good position uh, in the elections on our electoral list for your home city of Saleh. And Khalifi, in fact, accepted the deal. This created a series of divisions within the uh, February 20th movement and eventually led uh, to the party's, uh, or, excuse me, the movement's collapse and its division. A similar process happened in Mauritania where the regime party uh, approached uh, the members of the February 25th movement and essentially drew them into its ranks. Here, this is the weakening of Islamist movements. This picture takes uh, a little bit of description, but here we have, this is Fuad Ali al-Himma, the guy I mentioned earlier, the, the, the leader of this other pro-regime party. And here, this is uh, the, the leader of the Islamist party in Morocco, Abdelila ben Kiran, and this is another political party leader. And basically what happened was after the 2011 uh, parliamentary elections, the Islamists were very successful in Morocco, in the same way that they were in Tunisia and, and, and Egypt. But because of the success of these pro-regime parties in the election, the, the Islamists couldn't develop a full electoral coalition on their own. And so they had to strike deals with other parties. 
And essentially, the pro-regime party used this opportunity to foster conflict uh, between the different, uh, the different political party leaders that really hurt the, uh, the, 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 the public impression of the Islamist party and prevented them from implementing reform. Secondly, uh, the, the pro-regime party uh, scheduled a series of protests in Rabat, in Fez, in different cities in Morocco to promote various crimes that had happened in the early 1990s that they allege the Islamists were involved in. This also hurt the reputation of the party and in the end led to the, the collapse of the Islamist-led coalition in October 2013. So by way of conclusion, I want to talk about three different concepts. Co-optation strategies generally, authoritarian persistence, and Arab Spring democratization. In terms of co-optation, I think this is an incredibly difficult concept to understand, to measure, to define. And I think my research, I mean, it's one of the most, in my, in my opinion, one of the most abused terms in both public discourse, but also in academia. Everyone says, oh, this person is co-opted. Oh, this person is co-opted. Oh, this party is co-opted. But what kind of evidence can you really generate to, to show that it is or is not happening? How can you judge different parties' levels of co-optability, if you will? And I think my research starts to get at that. Secondly, in terms of persistence, you know, there's a big, big debate right now, as I said earlier, about monarchies and presidencies. You know, really focusing on the differences between these different formal institutions. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you go back to the post-colonial period, Morocco and Mauritania share a, a history of that at the very beginning of their forming, they, they, they shared power with rural elites and they brought them into their coalition of control. In contrast, in Tunisia, the, the rural elites were really displaced and there was an urban bias in terms of the way the regime was formed. So what made Morocco and Mauritania so persistent was their ability to monopolize the, the, uh, the, the, the rural structures of power in order to buttress their rule during the Arab Spring. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions.